the prince, count, governor of the domains of the sovereign in the lands of the Asiatics, true and beloved friend of the king, the attendant, Sinue, proclaims, I was an attendant who followed his lord, a servant of the royal harem, waiting on the princess, the highly praised royal wife of King Sesostris, the daughter of King Amenemhet. In the thirtieth year of Amenemhet, in the seventh day of the third month of the inundation, the god ascended to his horizon. The king of Upper and Lower Egypt flew to heaven and united with Ra, the divine body merging with its maker. Then the palace was hushed, hearts grieved, the royal doors were shut, the courtiers were head on knee, the people mourned. His majesty, however, had dispatched an army to the land of Libya, with his eldest son as its commander, the good god Sesostris. Now he was returning, bringing Libyan captives and cattle of all kinds beyond number. The officials of the palace sent to the western border to let the king's son know the event that had occurred at the court. The messengers met him on the road, reaching him at night. When he heard, not a moment did he delay. The falcon flew with his attendants, without letting his army know about it. His brothers, the royal sons who had been with him on this expedition, had also been sent for. One of them was summoned while I was standing close to him. I heard his voice as he spoke my name while I was in the near distance. And then my heart fluttered, my arms spread out, a trembling befell all my limbs, and I removed myself in leaps to seek a hiding place. And so I set out. I did not plan to go to the palace, for I believed there would be turmoil and did not expect to survive it. I crossed by boat and reached the Isle of Snefru. I spent the day there, departing at dawn, and I encountered a man who stood on the road. He saluted me, but I ran, for I was afraid of him. At dusk I reached Cattle Quarry, as it is called, and I crossed in a barge without a rudder by the force of the west wind. I passed to the east of the quarry, then made my way northward towards Sinai. I reached the walls of the pharaoh, which had been built to repel the Asiatics and to crush the sand people. I crouched in a bush until night, for fear of being seen by the guards on duty upon the wall. At dawn I reached Peten. I halted at the Isle of Kemwer when an attack of thirst overtook me. I was parched, my throat burned, and I said to myself, this is surely the taste of death. I raised my heart and collected myself when I heard the lowing voice of cattle and saw Asiatics. One of their leaders, Amenenshi, ruler of Upper Canaan, who had once visited Egypt, recognized me. He gave me water and boiled milk for me. I went with him to his tribe, and he gave land to me, saying, Allow me to make you my courtier, so that I may hear the language of Egypt. He said this because he knew my character, and had heard of my skill with words, and other Egyptians who were with him having bore witness for me. He said to me, Why have you come here? Has something happened in Memphis? And I spoke to him in half-truths, saying, The king has departed to the horizon, and one did not know the circumstances. When I returned from an expedition to the land of the Libyans, the king's departure was reported to me, and my heart grew faint. It carried me away on the path of flight. I do not know what brought me to this country. It is as if planned by a god. Then he said to me, How then is the land that is without that excellent god, whom all enemies feared like plague? I said to him in reply, Of course his son has entered into the palace, having taken up his father's heritage. He is a god without peer, a lord of knowledge, a wise planner, and a skilled leader. He was the smiter of foreign lands while his father stayed in the palace. He is a champion who acts with his arm, a fighter who has no equal. And now that he is king, he will conquer the lands of the Nubians as well. Then Amenenshi said to me, Well then, Egypt is happy knowing that he is strong. But you have come here. If it is your wish, you shall stay with me. In time he married me to his eldest daughter. He gave me some of his best land. It was a good land called Yah. Figs were in it and grapes. It had more wine than water. Abundant was its honey, plentiful were its oils. All kinds of fruit were on its trees. Barley was there and emmer, and no end of cattle of all kinds. Much also came to me because of Amenenshi's love for me. For he had made me chief of a tribe in the best part of his land. Loaves of bread were made for me daily, and wine is daily fare, cooked meat, roast fowl, as well as desert game, for they hunted for me and laid it before me, in addition to the catch of my own hounds. 
Many sweets were made for me, and milk dishes of all kinds. I passed many years. My children became strong men, each a master of a tribe of his own. I let all wanderers stay with me. I gave water to the thirsty. I showed the way to him who had strayed. I rescued him who had been robbed. When the Asiatics confederated to attack the rulers of the hill countries, I commanded armies. For Amenenshi made me carry out numerous missions as commander of his troops. Every hill tribe against which I marched, I vanquished, so that it was driven utterly from the pasture of its wells. I plundered its cattle, carried off its families, seized their food, and killed people by the strength of my arm, by my bow, by my movements, and by my skillful plans. I won his heart, and he loved me, for he recognized my valor, and he set me at the head of his children, for he saw the strength of my arms. Thus I became great, wealthy in goods, rich in herds. It was the God who acted, so as to show mercy to one with whom he had been angry, whom he had made stray abroad, for today his heart is appeased. Therefore, whichever God has decreed this flight, have mercy on me. Bring me home to the land of Egypt. Surely you will let me see the place which my heart dwells. I am a man of Egypt, and nothing is more important than that my corpse be buried in the land in which I was born. May Egypt's king have mercy on me. May I greet the mistress of the land who is in the palace. May I hear the commands of her children. Would that my body were young again, for old age has come, and feebleness has overtaken me. My eyes are heavy, my arms weak, my legs fail to follow. The heart is weary, and death is near. May I be conducted to the city of the dead, and may I serve Truth, who is the mistress of all, and may she speak well of me to her children. Thus speaks Sinue. <clears throat> Horus, living in births, the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Kepercare, the son of Re, Sesostris, who lives forever, royal decree to the attendant Sinue. This decree of Pharaoh has been brought to you to remind you that you fled Egypt and entered foreign countries by the counsel of your own heart. What had you done that one should act against you? You had not cursed so that your speech should be reproached. You had not spoken against the counsel of the nobles so that your words should have been rejected. This matter, it carried away your heart. It was not my heart to act against you. My wife in the palace lives and prospers to this day. Her children are in the palace. You will store riches which they give you. You will live off their bounty. Come back to Egypt. Be as you were. See the residence in which you lived. Kiss the ground at the royal gates. Mingle with the courtiers. For today you have begun to age. You have lost a man's strength. Think of the day of burial, the passing into reveredness. You of all people deserve the peace of mind to do so. We have made for you ointments and wrappings by the hand of Tite. A funeral procession is prepared for you on the day of burial. The mummy case is of gold. The head is of lapis lazuli. The sky will be above you as you lie in the hearse, oxen drawing you, musicians going before you. The dance will be performed at the door of your tomb. The offering list will be read to you. The sacrifice will be made before your offering stone. Your tomb pillars made of white stone are among those of the royal children. You shall not die abroad, nor shall the Asiatics inter you. You will not be wrapped in the skin of a ram to serve as your coffin. And so I returned to the land of Egypt. I was given a house and garden that had once belonged to a great courtier. Many craftsmen rebuilt it, and all its woodwork was made anew. Meals were brought to me from the palace three times, sometimes four times a day, apart from what the royal children gave without a moment's notice. A stone pyramid was built for me. The masons who built the tombs of the kings constructed it. A master architect designed it. A master sculptor carved upon it. Mortuary priests were given me, and a funerary domain was made for me. It had fields, and is done for a champion of the first rank. My statue was overlaid with gold, its skirt with electrum. It was His Majesty who ordered it made. There is no commoner for whom the like has been done. Such was I, Sinuhe, in the favor of kings until the day I departed to the west.